Hi folks. Let me take this opportunity to remind ourselves that repetitive DNA sequences make up most of a eukaryotic genome. We'll see shortly that transposons make up a large proportion of that repetitive DNA. But first, let's look at the amazing work of Barbara McClintock, who first discovered mobile elements or transposons. So what did McClintock do? She actually found two mobile genetic elements in maize, that's corn, based on work she did in the 1940s and 50s. At that time, the scientific community believed that all genes had a permanent address or locus on their chromosome, and they couldn't accept that genes could change their address, meaning they couldn't accept the idea that they might move from their original address to a different chromosomal locus. And if it appeared otherwise, as it did after McClintock began publishing, it would seem to be a one-off, a rare and isolated phenomenon at best. What's truly remarkable is that McClintock discovered mobile genetic elements using conventional Mendelian genetic techniques, that is, doing crosses, breeding, and counting progeny. And she did it on triploid tissues. Gene cloning and recombinant DNA technologies were decades down the road. A rediscovery of uh, so-called jumping genes, transposons, using these techniques decades later finally convinced the world that transposons were real, widespread, and in fact a significant proportion of eukaryotic genomes. So some more maze amazement, just a side note as it says, McClintock not only studied these mobile genes, but was way ahead of her time in thinking about gene regulation and this thing called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the phenomenon of inheritance of patterns of gene expression rather than just the genes themselves. It was a phenomenon that wasn't even named at the time she was working. All right, let's get back to reality. McClintock discovered mobile elements in the aluroni tissue of corn kernels. Let's look at maize reproduction and at these cells. All right, maize is monoecious, which means that corn plants are either male or female. They have separate male and female plants. Sperm produced in the tassels of male plants are spread during pollination to the stigma atop the silk of a female plant, as illustrated here. A pollen tube will grow through the silk through which sperm will travel to the eggs or ovules. The eggs, also called the female gametophyte, are in what will become the embryo sac. Fertilization occurs when the sperm reaches the egg. But at the same time, the polar bodies, which result from meiosis in the female, are also fertilized by a sperm, and this results in a triploid cell. While the diploid embryo develops from the fertilized egg, the triploid, fertilized polar bodies are what become the aluroni layer. So the, the aluroni cell layer consists of triploid cells. The triploid aluroni cells of the corn seed produce pigments called anthocyanins, and these give the kernels their color. The differential activity of enzymes that catalyze pigment production can cause variation in the color of seeds, as shown in this photograph. McClintock was interested in how the kernels on a single cob could show a range from colorless, that's white or yellow, to purple or dark brown or even variegated. She and others suggested that the genes involved in pigmentation were unstable and that they were altered in some but not other aluroni cells during seed development. Continued mitosis of cells with altered or mutated genes along with that of cells in which the genes were unchanged would lead to the colorful mosaic coloration of corn kernels that you can see on the mature cobs in the last photograph. To study this phenomenon, McClintock realized that she would be studying the genetics of triploid cells. McClintock studied three genes, but initially she actually looked at two genes that were involved in strains of maize that produced either colorless kernels or colored ones. So what were these two genes? The C prime and its recessive C allele. If present, a C prime allele would lead to colorless kernels, and this was true no matter what the rest of the genetic background might be. 
because the presence of a C prime allele prevented pigmentation, it was called the inhibitor allele. The other gene known to be involved in pigmentation is the BZ gene. The capital B lowercase z is the dominant allele, and the lowercase b lowercase z allele is the recessive one. Okay, in the absence of a C prime allele, capital B lowercase z led to purple seeds, and the lowercase b lowercase z, the recessive, would lead to dark brown seeds. In addition to the two strains that would produce either colorless or pigmented kernels, there were some strains that had a tendency to produce mosaic kernels. In these plants, a third gene called the DS gene was known to be responsible for the variegated seed color. DS is short for dissociator because it was believed to be a region of unstable DNA. Mutation of this DNA in some aleroni cells, but not others, during seed development would account for the variegated, that is, striped or spotted pigmentation in individual kernels. So let's look more at what McClintock actually did. She mapped the three genes to maize chromosome 9. And after she did that, she isolated a male of maize that was homozygous for the dominant C prime allele, the dominant capital B lowercase z allele, and also had the DS allele. Then she had a female that was homozygous for the recessive C allele and the lowercase b, lowercase z allele, and also lacked the DS allele. And she mated these two plants. So here's the cross. The triple recessive female and triple dominant male parental genotypes are shown here. And here are the expected genotypes of the progeny of this cross. The expected embryonic genotype of the progeny is shown at the left on this slide. Those of the aluroni cells are shown at the right. Remember that the aluroni genotypes are against a triploid, not a diploid background, hence the extra components of the genotype. Now what's amazing to me is that McClintock was following not one, not two, but three genes against this triploid background. In the case of the DS gene, the DS allele is indeed unstable and uh, dominant. Therefore, a stable allele, if present, would be recessive. As we'll see presently, the recessive state of DS is in fact its absence. We'll see that and understand that as we progress. The cross we just saw is illustrated in this schematic map of part of chromosome 9. The expectation from the cross is, of course, triple hybrid progeny. And there they are. So look at the three possible number nine chromosomes in the triploid cells that must result from this cross. All right, what should the seeds of these offspring look like? Now recall that the presence of the C prime or dominant allele of that gene should cause the production of nothing but colorless kernels in the progeny. The offspring phenotype should be cobs with all white or yellow kernels. Here's what McClintock found. There were, in fact, both colorless kernels and variegated kernels in which some of the cells could synthesize anthocyanins and some could not, which then led to the spotted or streaked phenotype in these mosaic kernels. Not what she expected, right? Here's what McClintock reasoned to explain her observations. For some cells to have reverted to pigment production, the C prime allele must have been inactivated. McClintock hypothesized that this could happen if the chromosome containing the C prime allele were somehow damaged or broken. In other words, dis its activity was, was disrupted. She suggested that the unstable DS locus was occasionally active, causing chromosome breakage and thus inactivation of the linked C prime allele in a given cell and its progeny. And, and there it is. Without an active C prime, those cells that had experienced the dissociation, the DS effect, would make brown or purple pigment, while the surrounding cells remain colorless. Further development of the seed would lead to the variegated, i.e. mosaic, kernels. It turned out that the DS element couldn't act alone, and here's how McClintock found this out. 
She did the same kind of parental cross as she did before, but this time she crossed the male triple dominance with a different strain of female, but one that had the same triple recessive genetic background as the first female strain that she had used. So the expected triple hybrid progeny in this case should have yielded the same phenotypes as the original cross, meaning she should have gotten some variegated seed production, right? Some variegated pigmented seed production. But the triple hybrid kernels in this cross were all colorless. There it is, they were all colorless. As if the DS element that was linked to the C prime allele that came from the male was on its own unable to cause a chromosomal break. McClintock reasoned that this second female strain lacked a gene that the females in her original cross did contain. McClintock realized that the DS gene apparently needed the help of this other gene, she, she hypothesized, in order to break. This gene was present in the original female strain, which allowed the dissociation phenomenon, but missing in the new female strain. McClintock called the new gene the activator, or AC gene. She defined DS and AC as an AC-DS system responsible for the genetics behind mosaic seed coloration. Further studies led McClintock to conclude that the DS gene was actually a mobile element. She didn't use the term transposon at the time, she referred to mobile elements. She was able to show that DS activity could sometimes inactivate not the C prime gene or the C prime allele, but the dominant BZ allele, so that the progeny of some crosses would have no purple kernels. After all, this allele, this, this gene, is linked to DS when it's present. At this point she realized that chromosome 9 containing a DS element was not simply breaking. The only way to explain what was going on was that the DS element must be dissociating in some way from its original locus, but movement into or next to either the C prime or the dominant BZ genes in order to disrupt them. And that's what I just said. So McClintock had discovered a mobile element long before transposons were found later in bacteria and eukaryotes, and for this and the rest of her remarkable career, she earned a Nobel Prize. We now understand that both the DS and the AC are transposons. AC can transpose independently because it contains all the features needed for mobility. One gene required for mobility or transposition encodes a transposase enzyme. We'll learn more about what this enzyme does shortly. For now, it's enough to note that the DS gene lacks the gene for transposase and therefore has no enzymatic capacity to transpose unless the AC transposase gene has been transcribed and the enzyme has been synthesized. The DS element then is a dependent transposon requiring the activity of the AC element. Credit our understanding of the AC-DS interaction to the development of recombinant DNA and DNA sequencing technologies. We also know now that AC and DS are structurally and in fact evolutionarily related. They are similar. DS is a truncated version of AC, having lost its transposase somewhere along the line. But DS, in fact, retains other features required for transposition. DS and AC transposition share features with other transposons, so let's look at those briefly. Both of them have 11 base pair inverted repeats at either end of the element, and after transposition, they leave an 8 base pair sequence in the same orientation i.e. direct repeats, of insertion site DNA flanking the elements that have just inserted themselves. Look for these features as we discuss transposons in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Shortly we'll take a closer look at what we know about transposons, how they move, and what they do in real life. But for now, that brings us to an end of this discussion of McClintock's amazing science.